I am uh, delighted. I, I I had been thinking for I have a, a truth be told I have a, a sort of list in my head of people that I would like to have as plenary speakers uh, for the PMR conference, and um, uh, Natalie Carnes has been on my list for some time, and uh, so I'm really thrilled that we can welcome her as our first plenary address uh, for this conference. Uh, Natalie Carnes is associate professor of theology at Baylor University. Um, having trained as an undergraduate at Harvard and then at the master's level at University of Chicago, my alma mater, um, she received her PhD from Duke University. She's the author of uh, three books, uh, Beauty, a Theological Engagement with Gregory of Nyssa from 2014 from Cascade Books, uh, Image and Presence, a Christological Reflection of Iconoclasm and Iconophilia uh, from Stanford University Press, and most recently, Motherhood, a Confession from this year, 2020, um, also from Stanford University Press. Professor Karn's scholarship is both historical and systematic. It's both tradition-oriented and critical. Uh, her work is thus a perfect fit, and this is why I knew that, that we wanted her with us uh, at some point. I'm so glad it could happen this year. Um, she's a perfect fit for the kind of work we do here at the PMR conference. She has an interdisciplinary scope. She demonstrates rigorous scholarly engagement with ancient uh, sources, with the conviction, though, that this engagement matters to how we live and think and perhaps even pray today here where we are. So the, there is no enemy between historical and, and systematic work in Natalie's uh, and Dr. Karn's work. Um, she is here to present to us today a plenary address called Bearing Witness Rhymes in Christian Art and Asceticism, and I am eager to uh, welcome Natalie Carnes as our first plenary speaker. Thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. And thank you, Dean Lindenmeyer, for uh, so graciously welcoming us into this virtual space. And thanks most especially to Jean Lochner for all the behind the scenes work she's done to make this event happen. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be able to have a little taste of the conversation so far and to get um, a sense of the range of conversations that this kind of colloquium, this conference can encompass. I've seen some really, um, really rich engagements already and I look forward to continuing those over the next couple of days with you. Going to, I'm going to begin today with a little scripture for you. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly crucified. Paul in this verse is admonishing the Galatians, scolding them for betraying the gospel after they have themselves witnessed Christ crucified. But what can he mean? Jesus was not crucified in Galatia. The Galatians didn't caravan en masse to Jerusalem for Christ's death. Likely no one reading Paul's letter ever met Jesus of Nazareth, much less did they see him before their eyes at Golgotha. They did, however, see Paul, who claims a few verses prior that he has been crucified with Christ. Therefore, Paul can say that God reveals God's own son, Enamoy, a phrase that could tra translate as to me or in me, or both. Revealing Christ to Paul and in Paul, God also publicly reveals Christ crucified to the Galatians by Paul. The apostle in this way establishes his authority as a messenger of the gospel by reminding the Galatians of his intimacy both with them and with Christ. With maternal force, Paul rebukes, cajoles, and encourages the church in Galatia not to give up his gospel, then offers his summary plea. From now on, let no one trouble me for I carry the marks, stigmata, of Jesus branded on my body. He pivots to a brief blessing and concludes the letter. The Christic marks on Paul's body become available anew to the church in Galatia and beyond by Paul's letter, which draws a verbal portrait of Paul bearing the cross of Christ. As the marked Paul mediates Christ, so too does the Galatian letter. One stigmatized mediation generates another. Through these linked images, Paul articulates a logic that will ultimately connect the ascetic and the artist. This connection is for me an important clue in a larger question I'm currently pursuing with my co-author and husband, Matthew Whalen. How can Christians justify 
making, enjoying, and supporting the arts in a world of extreme need. The question has haunted me over my years working in theology and the arts and hung over countless conversations with Matthew, who works on poverty, land reform, and ecology. Both his subfield of moral theology and mine of theological aesthetics are invested in exploring how we in our material lives are faithful to God, as well as how God comes to us in our material existence. And yet the commerce between them is limited. So we hope to open a fruitful line of conversation between them on poverty and art. And today I explore one aspect of that nexus of issues by asking, what has the artist to do with the saint, particularly the ascetic saint? Even that more limited question can only be partially considered today. So I'll focus on some key moments in the development of art and asceticism in early and medieval Christianity, leaving aside for now the question of what features of that relationship between artist and saint survive the transformations of modernity. So restricting myself to the first several centuries of Christianity, I hope to exemplify how ascetic saints galvanize artistic representation of their asceticism and also how artistic representations intend to inspire and prepare a person for the ascetic life of mercy. As we piece together some key moments in that history, we follow the stigmata of Christ, famously associated with St. Francis of Assisi. My life, Francis intimated, is a painting. Shortly after his death, Francis's intimation, like the saint's Christly imitation, is quite literally realized and he becomes one of the most popular subjects in Italian art. The artists and patrons who represented Francis illustrate a theme in Christian history. Like other Christian artists of antiquity in the Middle Ages, they tapped into a logic of image making deep in traditions of Christian asceticism, the logic of witness. So my plan is to glimpse important moments in the development and transformation of Christian art and asceticism by looking first at Paul, then at martyrology, hagiography, and iconography, and then at early Franciscan art. These moments exemplify how art firms, forms emerge in Christianity together with a commitment to asceticism and poverty as a mode of witness to Christ. Through these explorations, St. Francis will be a touchstone as that strange and compelling figure who eschewed earthly possessions and inspired visual sumptuousness. I have one example of such sumptuousness I wanna share with you. In an icon Bonaventura Berlingeri made just 10 years after Francis's death, the saint fills the length of the pentagonal, pentagonal panel. Against the gold leaf background, his figure cuts a stark silhouette. His long dark robe covers his body, the hood framing even his face like an inverse nimbus. Except for his face, the only visible parts of his body are his hands and feet, the sights of his stigmata. Represented as stylized uniform black circles, four wounds are visible, visually accentuated even by the strong color contrast with the gold of the background and tan of Francis's body. But where is the fifth? The largest and most controversial stigma, the side wound, is covered by his dark robe. Marking its location is a beautiful jeweled book, conveying the significance of what we cannot see. In place of the stigma, the book is offered to the beholder. One irony of the painting is that Francis is himself famously ambivalent about books. Books in the 13th century were highly expensive and the 1220 annual chapters of the emerging Franciscan order explicitly forbid the brothers from possessing them. The theologian and early Franciscan brother Bonaventure reports Francis taking apart the binding of a New Testament so that several brothers could read it at the same time. The ornamented bound book that Francis holds in Berlingeri's panel seems at one level, a betrayal of the saint's commitment to Christ-like poverty. But if it is a betrayal, it is not just so in the sense of unfaithfulness, but also in the sense of a showing forth. For the four uniform wounds that do not look like wounds, together with the book that is not a wound at all, evoke Francis's wounds by setting up a contrast. The highly ornamented book and stylized wounds underscore their artifice, pointing back to Francis with his God-given miraculous stigmata as an image of God not made with human hands. Berlingeri in his image displays its own distance from the event of Francis's stigmatization in order to mediate his stigmata more powerfully. Around the central stigmatized image of Francis are six smaller images, scenes from the life and posthumous miracles of Francis, 
that include his receiving of the stigmata. The style of painting, the Vita icon, is a technology that Paroma Chatterjee devotes a book to understanding and explicating. How and why, she asks, does it rise to prominence in the wake of Francis? How do the concealments and revelations of the saint's life motivate the representation offered in the Vita icon? Well, the Vita icon may be a relatively new technology during the Duecento, but the technology within it, the book, is much older and the written word older still. Six years before Berlingeri paints the first panel of the stigmatized saint, Thomas of Solano writes the first Life of Francis, hinting at without fully revealing the stigmata, which will be more fully described in his second life of 1246. And around 1200 years before that stigmatized life, Paul is presenting his own in a logic that subsequently shapes Christianity. At the very heart of the developing early Christian literary culture, Margaret Mitchell writes, is the phenomenon of the epiphany, a mediated manifestation of a deity. In an article that traces epiphany through the New Testament, Mitchell begins her analysis of what she calls the epiphanic evolutions in Paul. The letter to the Galatians is an epiphany of two linked mediations, the letter in Paul, by which Christ is mediated to the church in Galatia. And the letter is not unique in Paul's corpus. In a letter to the Corinthians, the epiphany registers in an olfactory image. Paul claims that God spreads the fragrance, or as Mitchell translate it, translates it, manifests the scent of knowing Christ in them. For the Corinthians are the aroma of Christ to God. Here it is not just Paul who smells of Christ, so does the Corinthian church, so that the epiphany is corporate, not just individual. And Paul then transposes the language of epiphany into a visual key, declaring that the Corinthians carry in the body and death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. According to Paul, Jesus is both visible and odorous in the bodies of the Corinthians. By them, as by him, Christ can be perceived. The logic of epiphany did not end with Paul, but was taken up into the gospel writings as Mitchell traces. Mark, the earliest gospel and the one directly influenced by Paul, plays with this epiphanic logic through the literary tool of irony in which the reader perceives an epiphany the characters do not. The epiphany, as in Paul's letter, comes through the text for the reader, and the reader sees the revelation of the Messiah as Jesus, even if the disciples, Pharisees, and crowds initially do not. Matthew and Luke, written after Paul, Mark and with knowledge of that gospel, continue in different ways Mark's strategy, embroidering and aggrandizing Mark's epiphanic narrative with stories of birth and resurrection appearances. Paul's textual epiphany then lodges itself firmly into Christian storytelling and thought. His strategy of describing Christ as the image of God and himself as the imitator of Christ develops a chain of mediations that structures Christian understanding of witness and cultivates a particular religious sensibility. What Paul inaugurated, Mitchell argues, was nothing short of a media revolution in which readers across space and time could encounter divine presence for themselves. We see the legacy of Paul's media revolution in early Christian martyrologies and hagiographies. Writing in the second century, Ignatius extended Paul's chain of mediations by articulating the Eucharist within it. He paints the image of martyr as Eucharist while anticipating his own martyrdom by wild beasts in his letter to the Romans. I am the wheat of God, he writes, and let me be ground by the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. The wild beasts whose jaws mean death for Ignatius also mean his transformation into the Eucharist of Christ, the bread of life. He desires, he writes, to imitate the suffering of Christ. The letter stops short of styling itself as an epiphany, but prepares the reader to anticipate the epiphany of Christ in Ignatius. In the martyrdom of Polycarp, the epiphanic moment is complete. Continuing Paul's aromatic imagery and combining it with Ignatius's Eucharistic addition, the text describes Polycarp's burned martyred flesh as smelling sweet and appearing like bread. Polycarp also refuses like Christ to flee his persecution and prays that God's will be done. His betrayers, like Judas, were thought to be friends. The police captain, eager to hand him over, is named Herod. 
As Polycarp imitates Christ, so does his martyrdom text mirror Christ's passion. In this way, it is representative of the martyrology genre. In her book on early Christian martyrs as other Christ, Canada Damas traces multiple features of the gospels that appear throughout the acts of martyrs, various allusions to cruciformity, the martyr committing his spirit to the Lord, the flow of blood and water, and the conversion of a military bystander. Taking on the marks of the gospels with their epiphanies of God, the acts of the martyrs are patterned as epiphanies themselves. As the gospels mediate Christ, so do the martyrs and written acts of the martyrs. So the age of the early martyrs eventually comes to an end and imperial persecutions of Christians wane. And at this point, monastic movements are growing and ascetics are increasingly described as imitators of Christ. Ascetics even come to be described as martyrs. Longing for a martyrdom that never comes, the ascetic hero of the life of Antony becomes a daily martyr to his conscience by right? taking up a severe ascetic discipline. Cyprian helps develop a theological strand reflecting on the white martyrdom of suffering and withdrawal that contrasts with the red martyrdom of a violent death. Augustine shifts the terms for martyrdom from an external to an internal battle, thus preparing the way for Pope Gregory's descriptions of asceticism as a hidden martyrdom and secret martyrdom. Their terms reflect an emergent understanding of ascetics as witnesses to Christ in a manner analogous to the martyrs. And as the acts of the martyrs witnessed to Christ, so did a new genre develop to mediate the witness of these ascetics. From the mid fourth century, in the midst of the ascetic revolution of late antiquity, Christian writers represented holy people through the genre of hagiography. Derek Kruger argues that the lives of hagiography are not only records of this ascetic revolution, they are also ascetic performances in their own right, in which writing becomes a means of ascetic transformation. In the form of his writing, the author models the humility and obedience of the saint he describes, which is ultimately the humility and obedience of Christ whom the saint imitates. The writer performs his asceticism in several ways, often through effacing himself as the author and denigrating his style. The author of sixth century text of Life of Daniel the Stylite, for example, begins by describing Daniel's life as great and brilliant and marvelous, whereas I am but witless and unskilled. Athanasius describes his stylized life of Antony as a hastily drafted letter. Theodora of Cyrus describes his religious history through written in an elevate, though written in an elevated style as merely a plain tale of some few facts. Other texts like the life of St. John the almsgiver or Leontius of Neapolis's life of Simeon the fool employ, employ a higher style in the introduction and epilogue, but a lower, more colloquial tone in the narrative itself. And Kruger describes all these stylistic choices as a ritual humiliation of the text, a way in which these written lives can bear the marks of their author's own ascesis. As a site in which the author performs a kind of asceticism, the text becomes a humiliated extension of the author's own body, an imitation of the saint who imitates Christ. In this way, it too mediates Christ, partaking of the logic of epiphany. As Kruger writes, Mortified, stigmatized by its own inadequacy, the text suffers humiliation in order to save. And the text saves by becoming an image of the one who saves. As these texts are figured as sites of Christ's saving body, so Christ's saving body is also figured as a text. Sixth century Constantinopolitan hymnographer Romanos the Melodist writes a hagiography of Christ himself. In his hymn on Peter's denial, he describes the crucifixion as an event of inscription. Speaking to Peter about his denial, Christ says, I am starting to write a pardon for all Adam's descendants. My flesh, which you see, becomes for me like paper, and my blood like ink, where I dip my pen and write. Crucifixion becomes an act of writing one's body as if it were paper, and so writing on paper also be can become a kind of crucifixion, an ascetic transformation into Christ. In his hymn on the Adoration of the Cross, for example, Romanos writes of the inscription above the cross as a metonym for Christ's flesh. Imagining the redeemed thief next to Christ approaching paradise with that inscription as a written pardon, Romanos writes, the cherubim receiving it recognized the letters shining out with the grace of the purple of blood. They delighted in how beautifully it had been dictated. 
A text is Christ's body. Christ's body is a text. This association of the wounded body of Christ and a text foreshadows the role the book will have in concealing and denouncing Francis' side wound centuries later in the Berlin Gary panel. In surveying these and similar hagiographical texts in late antiquity, Kruger concludes that asceticism and written saints' lives are a mutually bound development in late antiquity, an asceticism produced by this new literary discipline. The ascetic body, like the martyr's body, like the ecclesial body, like Paul the Apostle's body, witnesses to Christ in a powerful way that pressures new forms of representation. And these artistic representations inspire and prepare new acts of asceticism. One stigmatized corpus generates another. Visual art no less than literary emerged with the logic of witness. In his encomium on St. Theodore, Gregory of Nyssa writes of the martyr's relics as making the, writer, the martyr vividly perceptible to the beholder, evoking her tears and directing her to prayer so that the Holy One is present in a new way. The veneration of such precious relics generates reliquaries decorated with images which repeat the relics act of making present. Existing within a chain of mediation, such images, Charles Barber writes, mark a continuation in the claims to material truth made by the relics themselves, because visual representation can present the things it shows in a manner that is akin to the relics themselves. The veneration of relics and images are bound together in multiple ways, even if they are not justified in precisely the same terms, nor were relics the subject of the same kind of ancient controversy images were. For images and relics remain yoked in the logic of witness. The idea of witness and making present is in particular is important to both icons um, and the way that icons witness. And one of the great defenders of icons during the Byzantine iconoclast controversy was Theodore of Studios, who claimed the body of Christ or the saint was available to the viewer of the icon by imitation. The icon for Theodore serves as an eyewitness to Christ and so extends the witness of Christ. Theodore makes this argument by drawing on the already developed theology of martyrs and extrapolating from the way martyrs and their relics are witnesses to and of Christ to postulate the same of the icon. If such witness is not possible, Theodore asks, then what use is the body of the martyr, which is the imitation of that which is heavenly? The icon, like the body of the martyr, is an imitation of Christ, though in the medium of wood and paint rather than flesh and blood. The icon thus affirms as a sensible fact what our mind has assented to by faith. It is an event that makes present that which would exist otherwise only in the mind, according to Theodore. In Theodore's words, the imaginary is completed by becoming visible in the enacted form of an icon. As a martyr makes present Christ crucified, as an ascetic does the same, so an icon makes Christ perceptible to us. The intimacy of the icon and the subject extends the witness still further, rendering us witnesses. The Icona Dual Nicophorus emphasizes this in his theology as he describes the icon as providing an eyewitness account, imitating an event or person in order to inspire us to imitate that event or person. The art brings the subject into the present, inhabiting our imaginations that we might re-perform it. The mediations continue, turning the beholder into a witness, imitating the Christ she perceives in the icon that also imitates Christ. It is a chain of ascesis. To gaze at an icon of Mary and the Christ child is to perceive the holiness of their persons and potentially be transformed by that perception into a holier person. An icon can perform this mediation and avoid idolatry because it performs its own ascetic renunciation by the type of aesthetic object it is. The intimacy of an icon of Christ and Christ is so strong that Theodore describes the honor given it, the icon, passes through to the one depicted. So to venerate an icon is not idolatry, for it is to venerate Christ, the result, which is the result of the icon's own ascesis. The icon's asceticism directs the perceiver through its material existence to the divine presence that is not reducible to that material existence. It negates itself to mediate that which is beyond itself. In this way, its asceticism imitates the asceticism of the word made flesh, 
when God bound God's self to human finitude in Christ, who humbles himself and continually points to, reveals, and glorifies the Father in heaven. When Theodore claims that the honor given to the image passes through to the prototype, he is drawing on the theology of Basil of Caesarea, who uses the same language to describe why the incarnation is not idolatry. To worship Christ, Basil claims, is not separate from worshiping the one true God. Christ makes God present on earth as an image, the image of the invisible God, and images of Christ also make Christ present on earth, though they bear a different kind of divine presence. These images can point to Christ, moreover, because of their own renunciations, the way they direct the gaze beyond themselves. In this way, icons are as much ascetic objects as hagiographic texts are, and they imitate Christ by resisting the temptation to seize power and attention solely for themselves. For centuries, Byzantine icons like the one Theodore and the Iconodules defended dominated visual art. But new forms of visual imaging began developing and accelerating in the high Middle Ages, particularly with the advent of Francis. Bonaventure describes the stigmatization of Francis by invoking a powerful biblical precedent. Francis came down from the mountain, he writes, bearing with him the likeness of the crucified, depicted not on tablets of stone or on panels of wood carved by hand, but engraved on parts of his flesh by the finger of the living God. Bonaventure alludes to Moses' descent down Sinai as he carries tablets engraved by the finger of God. These poetic tablets contrast with the idol Moses will find at the foot of the mountain, where the people of God dance around a golden calf cast by Aaron's hands in Moses' absence. In Bonaventure's telling, Francis' body also carries an achiropoetic engraving. He is an image of the crucified, one that Bonaventure elevates above both human-made artifacts like the golden calf and even above the tablets of stone Moses carries. For Francis is a divine image made in flesh, a living image engraved by the living God. God has made him a vital image of the crucified, art that breathes. In the fourth century, as hagiography was emerging as a genre and ascetic programs transforming spirituality, Basil of Caesarea compares the Christian pursuing sanctification to a painter who carefully observes a model to imitate its characteristics in her art. In the same way, the Christian turns her eyes to the saints as though to living and moving statues, he writes, to carve in her life replica statues as a sculptor works on stone. 800 years later, Francis has become a living statue of the crucified. Here is a saint for Christians to model their own replica statues on. But by the time Bonaventure writes his, his, his story of Francis, Francis is dead. How can a person keep her eyes turned to Francis as Basil exhorts us when the saint is no longer present among us? As he writes the life of Francis, Bonaventure is thinking about this question of representation. Before the stigmatization account, he reports an episode in which Francis is asked what he thinks about his friar studying. The saint replies, according to Bonaventure, that he is happy with his brother studying. As long as they pray more than they read, so following the example of Christ, of whom, this is a quote, of whom we read that he prayed more than he read. To imitate Christ is to pray, but to know how to imitate Christ, to observe Christ, involves reading. We need art to direct us, to energize us to asceticism. For what of Francis? How do we know how to imitate Francis? How do we know, as William Cook asks, that Francis uniquely bore Christ's wounds on his body, that his flesh was transformed by the finger of the living God? Bonaventure has just provided one answer. We can read about it as we read about it in his telling of Francis's life or in Thomas of Solano's. But that's not the only way. We can also have images. Cook writes, we can also see the wounds of Christ on Francis because of Francis' stigmatized image on a painted panel of wood. So we are able to experience Francis through an image on wood the way Francis experienced Christ on the cross through an image on wood at San Damiano. In other words, the visual representation of Francis' wounds is a particularly fitting way to communicate them because it echoes the way Francis first received those wounds through an image. 
The way an image can mediate Christ, can witness to Christ, is intrinsic to Francis's own story of conversion and rebirth into Christ. And the evidence of his rebirth is astonishingly visible on Francis's very body as the stigmata. To perceive Francis is better than to perceive a panel of Francis, and to see Christ is better than to see Francis. But divine presence can still be authentically and transformatively encountered in these mediations. The San Damiano crucifix, a relatively new version of the cross at the time Francis encounters it and is transformed, is evidence of this. In Thomas of Solano's telling, Francis is kneeling before the crucifix in the ruins of the church at San Damiano when the image speaks to him. With the lips of the painting, the image of Christ says, Francis, go, rebuild my house. As you see, it is all being destroyed. Thomas describes the event's impact on Francis. From that time on, compassion for the crucified was impressed onto his soul. And we honestly believe, he writes, the wounds of the sacred passion were impressed deep in his heart, though not yet on his flesh. Later, Francis will receive wounds in his flesh, the famous stigmata, and those wounds, his companions write in another telling of the story, are renewals of these earlier heart wounds received at San Damiano. By the San Damiano crucifix, Francis reads words from Christ himself, receives words from Christ himself, and in that encounter, his own transformation into an image begins. After Francis has transformed into that image, after he has died and is no longer available to the human gaze, Franciscans influenced by him begin to provoke transformations and artistic representations of Christ. Before Francis, the crucified Christ was often depicted as the triumphing Christ. And after Francis, the images of the suffering Christ begin to eclipse that depiction. They lay claim to the emotions of the viewer, quickening an affect of piety that becomes central to the Franciscan order. Depictions of Francis also change art forms. The difficulty of representing Francis and his own imaging of Christ, his concealments and revelations, generates some of the first Vita icons, the Berlin Gary panel, a form that becomes popular for portraying Francis and later other saints as well, including Mary Magdalene, Margaret of Cortona, and Claire of Assisi. The life of Francis, the way it mediates Christ, its peculiar tensions of visibility and concealment, generates and elevates new forms of visual culture. It was not just Francis's stigmata that led to transformations and artistic representation. The kinship at the heart of his asceticism also nourished new strands of visual culture. The very importance given to creation, the kinship and significatory status Francis underscores in the Canticle of the Creatures, pressures a corresponding visual attentiveness in the representation. If creation gives us God, then it demands a precise attentiveness. The attention to accuracy is expressed in Francis's recreation of the nativity scene, the first of its kind. For Francis, it was important to have live animals and the correct live animals to represent the scene of Christ's birth. Having the animal species that correspond to our stories of Bethlehem was important to being able to be imaginatively present at Bethlehem in that grotto in Grecio. In this emergent naturalism, we witness the influence Francis will have on Western art. Cook makes the bold claim that in that highly individuated and realistic style of the Duecento, we see the influence of both Aristotle and Francis. The former is recognized, the latter, Cook laments, is not, even though the point was thoroughly argued in a book by Heinrich Thode a century ago. The realistic style drew a person into a creation that images God and into a life that imitated Francis's. By such images, one could hope to draw others into a life that imitated Francis's. Thus, images that strive for naturalistic fidelity, for an affective grip by which they entered the hearts and minds of their beholders, rose to prominence by the Franciscans. Of course, the inclusion of the animals in Francis's Christmas crib, Agrecchio points not just to a naturalistic fidelity arising from his understanding of the kinship of all creatures. The animals at the birth of our Lord also speak to another commitment of Francis's, which also arises from such kinship and is related to his asceticism. Poverty. For Francis, poverty is the way by which one enters more deeply into kinship with God's creatures. By poverty, a person experiences communitas, which is both a feeling of community and a movement into the life of Christ. 
A person moves toward God and other creatures in poverty by leaving behind those things that prevent perfect community, like status and hierarchy, in imitation of the Lord who emptied himself and took on the form of a bondservant for love of us. A person's embrace of poverty imitates Christ's own embrace of poverty, which he undertook for love of us and which is most perfectly expressed on the cross by which Christ unites with us. More than simply an ascetic tactic, Poverty for Francis is, in the words of Xavier Subera, the very choreography of Francis's union with Christ. As Christ's wounds express God's love for us and Christ's mediating role between earth and heaven, so too does Francis's stigmatized body testify to the love that bridges earth and heaven. Through poverty, he receives the marks of the God who became poor, and through his poverty, his life becomes a gift that can fulfill the injunction at San Damiano, rebuild my church. In both the extreme poverty and the correct animals in the creche, St. Francis embraces deep, the deeply literal sense, embraces deeply the literal sense, which then opens for him to the spiritual precisely by way of his intense commitment to the literal. Francis's journey begins in some ways at that speaking image of San Damiano, when his heart was wounded with stigmata that God would later, later carve on his flesh. After his death, his story continues in images and texts that witness to Francis's life in forms Francis himself could not have anticipated and possibly would not have condoned. But artistic forms were pressured by the centrality of witness within Christianity. In the wake of Francis, the Franciscans found the Vita icon a form more congenial to witnessing to Francis's witness to Christ than the traditional icon. The way the Vita icon includes multiple narrative scenes that allow for complex presentation of identity and Christly presence helped elucidate Francis's unique witness and confirm the saint's reputation as an altar Christus. Unlike the traditional icon in which the viewer gazes at a single scene, the Vita icon interrupts the viewer's gaze, adverting to the partial access the viewer has to Francis's life continuing to communicate and teach the dynamics of revelation and concealment that characterized Francis's own imitation of Christ. The rise of Franciscan art in this way continues the legacy of witnessing to Christ that characterizes the artistic history we have traced from Paul's letters through the age of the martyrs and their acts and the hagiography of late antiquity. What these martyrs, ascetic saints, writers, and artists attempt to present is Christ or a person who images Christ for the purpose of staging a divine encounter that inspires the beholder, listener, or reader to herself become an image of Christ through an ascetic transformation. While it seems impossibly incongruous that the saint who owned nothing, remained ambivalent about books, and aspired to absolute poverty spawned some of the most visually lavish paintings of the 13th century, these two aspects of the saint's legacy, the poverty and the art, are not only not incongruous or are not nearly incongruous, they are each sustained by the same logic of image and presence. By the lips of an image, St. Francis received Christ's message, rebuild my house. Francis first attempts a literal pair, repair, rebuilding the church of San Damiano from dilapidation. Then realizing what seems a misunderstanding he embarks on a vocation indebted to a more allegorical interpretation of the command, repairing the Catholic Church with his witness to the poverty of Christ. Sometimes Francis's first response is understood as a mistake he first learned to correct, a false interpretation of the command. But are his two interpretations so disjunctive? Is it like Francis, whose imitation of Christ was so breathtakingly literal? to see a literal interpretation of Christ's words as a mistake? And is it like one who just received the words of Christ from the mouth of an ecclesial artwork to repudiate the importance of liturgical objects? Perhaps instead of there being two competing interpretations, one literal and wrong, the other spiritual and right, the words of Christ bear both interpretations, the literal opening to the spiritual, such that the material repair of the church helps witness to, energize, and inspire its spiritual repair. In the end, Francis rebuilds the church by beginning with his repair of the ruined building, a literal interpretation, which prepares him for the spiritual rebuilding, a spiritual interpretation of the command, which he accomplishes by his commitment to poverty, a literal interpretation of the imitation of Christ. 
the witness of art, the building, the image, and the witness of Francis's own ascetic brotherhood and sisterhood through Claire are ordered together rather than against one another. Art can prepare for, inspire, and render the beauty of asceticism as the ascetic also renders herself a compellingly perceptible figure of Christ. And that's not to say the witness of art and asceticism, and asceticism that they are always resonant, nor that the literal and spiritual interpretations of rebuilding Christ's church sit easily together. The Basilica in Assisi meant to honor the legacy of Francis shortly after his death was seen by many Franciscans to be a betrayal of it. The controversy over building that church reminds us that art and asceticism, even when ordered to the same end, often come to us knotted in complex and competitive relations. They require careful negotiations. Art can distract us, can attract us, our energies and our resources away from asceticism. And yet art can also bear witness to Christ, not as a distant object, but as present within the act of witnessing. And today, both artist and ascetic bear Christ to new peoples, places, and times, testifying to Christ's aliveness in the world. We saw this logic of witness germinate in the letters of Paul, who presents himself as an artistic maker, subject, and object. And in early Christian hagiography as well, when the texts are mortified and the author disclaims his abilities. By the time we get to Franciscan art, it is the artistic subject that is foregrounded, though the object and the maker also bear ascetic marks. We saw the objects of asceticism in, for example, the Berlingeri panel, where the depiction exaggerates the artificiality of its wounds to disavow its status as Francis, and in that way point more emphatically to Francis as one greater than any artistic representation. The object de decreases so that the subject, Francis, ultimately Christ, might increase. Energized by commitment to Christ crucified and resurrected, the wounded one who yet lives among us, both art and asceticism are stigmatized by a constraint born into an excess. Marks they acquired in early and medieval Christianity and continue to bear even now, even in an age when art has traveled far from this logic of witness. Thank you. Natalie, thank you so much. And I wish that you could uh, enjoy the uproarious applause that, I, that, <laughs> that I'm sure would usually follow. Well, friends, uh, we do have some time for conversation. What a rich presentation. And I'm sure that you, uh, you have uh, comments and, and questions uh, to, uh, to engage uh, Natalie in further conversation with. I'd ask that you use either the raise hand function through the participants area uh, or the chat function, and I will do my best to keep up with both. And um, so when I call on you, when I recognize you, uh, I invite you to unmute yourself and, uh, and address your question or your comment to Natalie uh, directly. All right, so please, uh, everyone, uh, take your moment. It's like one of these moments when you're waiting for uh, survey results to roll in, right? I feel that I have exposed myself equally to all areas of expertise. I, I sort of anticipated someone's sort of thinking in the audience, like, did she think that the patristic medieval and Renaissance conference meant that she had to engage all three periods? <laughs> so I, 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 well, I applaud it. I have to say, I really do. Yeah. But I'm sure I have much to learn. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chung Su has a comment. So uh, Chung Su, I invite you to address your question. Thank you. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. Um, in your, is the work of art in the icon different from the work of art in the modern art? Seems to me that there's a fundamental change in the function of art after Renaissance. Yes, yes, there is. Um, and um, one of the principal differences and the most obvious and important for this argument is that Christ is no longer the subject of most art after the Renaissance. Most modern art doesn't take um, Christ to be the subject or saints to be the subject, nor do they have take as their intention sort of mediating um, Christ's presence on earth. Um, and yet there, there are important features of this relationship to asceticism that I think continue to survive in modern art and even a certain subset of art that continues to be engaged with witness in interesting ways. Um, and so I'll speak 
you can ask me about the witness if you're interested or someone can later, but I'll just speak briefly to the asceticism aspect of it, which is that um, I think asceticism survives in, in three different areas. One is that the artist, what it means to be an artistic object is to inhabit a particular genre or form which comes with certain kinds of constraints and art comes in the negotiation of those constraints to have an excess that's beyond its material existence. So the form itself um, bears a kind of excessiveness and two examples would be um, um, that I think are really interesting negotiations of constraint and excess. One is um, Gerard Manley Hopkins who invents a new way of sort of counting the lines of a poem so that you can have unlimited unstressed syllables and you're only counting the stressed in a way that puts a new kind of constraint that allows his lines to go on and sort of mirror this excessiveness, which then helps him take up what he thinks a poem should do, which is sort of to present the thisness of the world in a way. Um, another artist that I think is doing this in a very different but very powerful way is Carol Walker, who I don't know if you're familiar with her art, but it's these very like the, the um, she's most famous for her um, like paper cut arts, which are like um, it's very sort of genteel, like refined art form. It's very delicate. Um, you expect to find sort of delicate maidens growing into like lovely womanhood or something like that, little stories like that in them. And she uses them to represent sort of the horrific scenes of sexual exploitation in the antebellum South. And the contrast between the kind of restraints of the form and the explosive horror of the subject sort of just means that her art, it hits you with this very powerful force. So one level is the artwork itself. Then the other level is the, um, the making of the artwork is itself a kind of ascetic practice in which the artist is engaged in thinking about just in the act of making the good of the object. Your own needs become secondary, your own ego becomes secondary to uh, what it is th this object is demanding in order to be a good version of itself. Um, and then the third way, um, those two I think are quite intimate with art. The third is like more, is a little looser, which is the artist's own life. That it's sometimes the case that this, the asceticism of art making habituates the artist into a kind of asceticism that redounds into her life more generally. So this trope of a starving artist sort of is, hinting at that, where part of um, devoting yourself to the good of this object then redounds into a larger life of sort of sacrifice for the good of art itself or something. Um, and so you see a, a kind of self-denial that can characterize the life of an artist, not always, but sometimes. And we tend to elevate those cases as particularly revelatory of what art is. Like we don't think of like the, the wealthy artist is revelatory of what art is in the same way we think of the starving artist as somehow revealing us to us something about the character of art. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. I'd like to go to Michael Kamenicki and then to Casey Kimball, please. So um, this is gonna be a little bit of a like, feel a, more of a theological question than a historical one. Um, but I, <laughs> I am wondering how, so there are all kinds of images that are portrayals of Christ and there are all sorts of images that are portrayals of St. Francis or claim to be some form of this person's avail extended availability to us mm -hmm. through time. So icons of Christ are Christ's extended embodied availability to us through time, though mediated through paint and wood. Um, Theologically speaking, is there anything that might differentiate a painting of Christ that successfully mediates Christ and a painting of Christ or an image of Christ that unsuccessfully mediates Christ? Is there a pneumatological operation there or some sort of explanation for how, or is it just our own uh, our own sort of subjective soteriological appropriation of this is an image of Christ that makes it an image of Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, Michael. It does make sense. Um, so I think we could probably sit down and brainstorm together some ways, um, aesthetic markers that generally point to more successful images of Christ than others. 
but I don't think that there's such a thing as universal aesthetic markers for successfully um, meeting, unless they're at a very general level. Um, I mean, I think all successful images of Christ are going to in some ways point back to Christ, but that is going to always be negotiated in a relationship between the artist, uh, or between, between the holder, beholder and the art um, in a way that's going to take into account the histories and contexts of the one who is beholding it, right? So um, I, in other words, no image is ever safe from becoming an idol. Any image can become an idol at any time. And I say more hesitantly, I think any Im any anything that has been idolatrous can also become for us um, an image into, um, into Christ. Um, I think that that may only be able to happen in certain cases through prayer, um, but I do think it's possible. So that's to say, I think imaging of Christ names a relationship or imaging itself names a relationship between the image and the beholder. And you can never sort of um, identify idolatry and not idolatry apart from that relationship. That's an awesome answer. Thank you. Uh, Casey Kimball, please. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in how you talk about the capacity for images to energize the subject. Um, and it seems like there's some sort of aesthetic conversion um, that has to happen prior to that. Um, and potentially a conversion that we see embodied in Francis's own experience, um, that he's like slowly under the influence of these um, different Christological in images that come to them. Um, and of course, like of Christ himself as an image, like people respond, some people are galvanized by him positively and others like quite negatively. So um, this is a huge question and nobody I ask will answer it for me. So um, no pressure. <laughs> um, but I, I do wonder how you think about like what, um, is it just kind of a miraculous act of grace um, that we can't, nudge at all um that that gives images this galvanizing power um or are there is there something more either aesthetically or theologically kind of strategic about what's going on yes all of those <laughs> um and, and that i i um cornelius cornelius Sakaridu has this really beautiful book um icons in time persons in eternity that it does a really important corrective to a lot of icon theology by focusing on icons as aesthetic objects and the way that they are successful by their, um, the, qu the quality she picks out is energia, which is like a kind of liveliness or aliveness. And that's not just some sort of, you know, woo woo mystical term, right? She's like, she's identifying particular aesthetic qualities that can impart that energia. And she draws interesting continuities between some modern art and these icons. But if you read Francis's account, it's also like an interestingly dense account. I wish I had it right in front of me and we could sort of read it together because, um, it, let's see if I can remember some of the, how it goes. Like he, he goes into the cross to pray and as he entered, as he's, as he's there, he feels himself to be changed and then he's praying before the, the, the San Damiano crucifix and then the lips of the image speak to him. I mean, that's obviously a grace that no amount of like energia or preparation can, can create, right? That's just a grace that's given to him. And yet there's also been clearly like changes prior in his life that have prepared him to receive the words of that image. And, um, and it's also not words that he's fully received in the moment. Part of what's so interesting about that account is that this miraculous speaking image is a gift he has to learn to receive over the course of the next several years, right? So it's not that the image has this, you know, once and for all, like, and now he's, now he's, he's got it, he's on his way. It's something that he sort of continually returns back to and receives and, and that, and he receives it in part through his own works of mercy. Um, so yes, it's the Holy Spirit. Yes, the aesthetic qualities of the icon are important, which is why 
the particular aesthetics of that image then become important to the to um, the, to the Franciscans, right? It's not just any old image. It's this kind of image. And how many of us have San Damiano crucifixes precisely because of this moment? Um, and so, and yes, it's the preparation that he goes through ahead of time. It's all of those things. So I, I imagine that's why it's hard to question to answer because there's nothing, there's not one thing to pin it on. It's part of a whole story. Yeah, thank you. That's a thicker answer than I've gotten thus far. So I'll, <laughs> I'll go find that book. <laughs> that's great. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, assert my rights as uh, host here to, uh, to ask my own question here, because I think it uh, actually fits really well. Um, uh, Natalie, I'm really, I mean, I'm, I, I love the fact that you picked Francis because I'm so interested in Francis uh, myself, but also it's an interesting choice in this sense that it, you, may be, you may know or you may not know, John Milbank has written several things um, in which he critiques the sort of the sort of the, the literalness of Francis's imitation of Christ and the, and the sort of uh, the, the real specificity of uh, that imitation as a kind of, as, as in a sense, a constriction of, uh, of imitatio, such that it prevents or constrains non-identical repetition from taking place in other places. And this is one of the bad things that leads to what, what John calls a, you know, a Franciscan modernity. So how do you navigate that sort of specificity and the kind of literalness that, that you rightly sort of point to both in Francis himself and in the art that, that, it, that, it, uh, that, that represents him? Uh, does that constrain or if not, how not? Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, part of what I find so compelling about Francis is his deep commitment to the literal. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I, I encountered some versions of those critiques also in, in Yoder, who talks about it as a kind of outward and wooden kind of um, appearance or outward wooden kind of imitation. I think, uh, first of all, I, I mean, this, not to get too, too deep into metaphysical territory, I have not really any business to be in, but I, um, I'm highly doubtful that any repetition is non-identical. I mean, this is the whole philosophy of images that um, to be an image is to be uh, both what and, and an image with is and is not what it images. Um, and um, no image is identical to what it, it images because it's something else. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not an image, it's the thing that itself. So uh, I think what's interesting about Francis is that I, just historically, how quickly. Um, um, a kind of allegory emerges from that. Like, what do you make of Bonaventure, the Franciscan, you know? Um, and his, uh, and Francis's very sort of visual moment of receiving the stigmata and this prior moment that I've been talking about the image and receiving the, the soul stigmata sort of suggests the way that the literal is a, a way into the spiritual for him. And maybe it's not the same kind of the way that Milbank prefers that we open into the spiritual, but it it's not a place that's that stays in um, a kind of literalizing mode, which is what I refer to in um, a mode that I refer to in my, my book on images, where a literalizing is a refusal to open to the spiritual, but a literal is the way that um, the, the is some is a is a version of the literal that is willing to and capable of opening up to something beyond it, and that's to me what what images do. They are literal and that they are uh, material. Uh, they have a material existence, but that material existence is in its nature as an image pointing beyond its own material existence. So images to me are so fascinating because they hold together both the literal and the spiritual in their nature as image. To, otherwise they're not a successful image. They're just an object, right? And so Francis's life um, um, is very compelling to me because it exemplifies this holding together of the literal and the spiritual. And so it's unsurprising to me that you find an image at the very center of it. Thank you, that's brilliant. Uh, Glenn Lemondowski. Thank, thank you very much, Natalie, for your uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, presentation. It was, it was stunning, awesome. 
actually. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I would like to, uh, uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about the, uh, the contrast, my order, the order of the Holy Cross, mm-hmm. founded in 1210, Francis 129. We've always been brothers in uh, a lot of competition and a lot of fraternity, both. But but particularly the cross, the the cross that uh, that you you emphasize on uh, in your aesthetic uh, emphasizes and privileges the pain, the suffering, and the poverty uh, of Christ. And I, I I don't argue with that at all. But I think this is the contrast in the first millennium was a cross of the precious cross, the jeweled cross without a corpus uh, attached to be to be more like the Pauline uh, uh, emphasis on revealing God, how great God's power to save is embodied in, and, uh, in, in, in the epiphanic understanding of the glory of the cross coming, uh, the glory of God coming through on this cross. And, and so the, the liturgical cross was, was jeweled and it was covered until Good Friday, and that's when that's when the, uh, the 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 revelation of the jewels came out. In the current uh, situation, post Franciscan situation, the jewels, of course, are never there, and and then what is revealed is uh, wounds, stigmata, pain and suffering, and penitentialness, if you will. And I and I'm wondering whether that that accent on penitential. Uh, Christianity, I think it's, it's in spades in the bishops of the United States at this point, a, a strong sense that we participate in, in the church to be more and more and more penitential without a great deal of appreciation that we have been transformed by the epiphany of God revealing himself in God's cross. Uh, so so there's, there, it's, it is a different aesthetic and a different, a different uh, choice of what are the concrete in some ways literal, but also then spiritual accents that that cross brings forth. So, so I, I, don't, I don't deny that there is an importance to the, to the Franciscan. I don't deny that at all. I lived with Franciscans for 22 years of my life personally. But then there, then there is this other dimension that we, we've, always, uh, we've always argued about saying that there is, we did, our order never had the stations of the cross. We never had the penitential cross. Our habit was not raggy like it it was for francis that 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 icon that you showed was not a very good picture of, of what the franciscan poverty habit would be like ours was a vestus nuptialis a uh, uh, a going to the to the wedding feast of the kingdom very different contrast aesthetically uh, so so my comment my, my question for you is is the the importance of doxology and awesomeness within aesthetics rather than uh, a kind of a, a drudgerous poverty and low, loathsomeness, if you will. Your comment on that, please. Yes, thank you. That is a wonderful question. Um, I mean, my, my response is like, how beautiful to have a church that you have one order that um, celebrates the wounds on Good Friday and another that represents the jewels, um, cross with jewels, like that, that, that you have both is so beautiful. Um, it reminds me of the, the, the conversation that was happening right when um, Pope Francis came into the papacy and he took his his simple habit and people kept comparing him to Pope Benedict XVI's very like ornate one and how both of them were attempts to be witness to God in different ways and both are um, important and I think that the way that they witness to God uh, and whether which one is success more successful than another and whether it's even right to speak of one is more successful than another depends a lot on the particular context in which one finds oneself right that um, um, in if you're in a church that is consistently um, um, sort of reifying and supporting the social hierarchies in which it finds itself, then having leaders of that church ornamenting themselves in jewels is going to communicate something quite false about who God is, right? That's what I take it like that, the pact of the catacombs, like those the, the, the bishops in Latin America recognize. And then um, 
Um, but that's not to say that like beautiful jewels and stuff always communicates that. In a, in a church that's ordered towards a kind of sharing in which, I mean, I think it was very beautiful. One of the things that Pope Francis did when he came into um, um, St. Peter's was to open up the, Vat the Vatican museums to the homeless who lived there. Like not just, you know, um, install showers and things like that and programs, which he did, but then also to open up the art museums to them as a way of sort of recognizing that this art belongs to all of us, including those who don't have homes to sleep in. The best art of the Christian tradition is not doesn't belong just to scholars and the wealthy and it belongs to them as well. So um, anyway, part of where I think I, I'm interested in going with this project thinking about poverty and art is that to me this this idea of different orders um, having different charisms is a really important way to recover. But it's tricky to think how do you recover it in a way that's not like, well, Franciscans, you've got property taken care of, so I'm going to go off and do my scholarship now, so thank you very much. Like, how do you recover it in a way where the charisms are mutually like informing and challenging of one another, right, where the Franciscans witness sort of calls the Dominicans to think differently about their scholarship and where, you know, um, and I, I don't think that there's going to be like an easy way to work that out. Like, what do you do with the fact that Cistercians sort of reject illuminated manuscripts? Like, I, there's not a way to make them okay with it, I don't think. But, um, but I think trying to find ways of holding the community together while recognizing the diversity of gifts has got to be part of uh, where we go as a church. I, I say we, I'm actually Protestant. I just sort of fake my way into the we of Catholicism. My husband's Catholic. And so we, we attend um, both Catholic and Protestant service. I think Not we're all both Catholic and Protestant. We're all both. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Adams Eilers, please. You need to unmute yourself. There you got it. There you go. Hi, I just wanted to tell you I really appreciate your presentation and it, the generosity and hospitality with which you answer your questions. Uh, I mean, you pour yourself out um, answering the questions in such a full way, a richness that I really appreciate. But my question is very simple. Uh, you're, you're focusing on the cross of San Damiano and um, you know, and on the intense experience that Francis must have experienced when he heard Jesus talking to him from the cross. And I was wondering if your research has uncovered any um, stories or any theological comments about the, uh, the fact that the Claire's, poor Claire and her sisters actually lived in that church that uh, St. Francis rebuilt. So the cross of San Damiano I'm assuming was there with them. And I, my imagine my religious imagination wants me to see them gazing at that cross every day and wondering what kinds of interactions with, with the uh, divinity or humanity of Jesus that they must have experienced as they gazed at that cross like Francis did. And that's my question, if you, if you ran into anything in your research. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That is a beautiful question. I would love to know that too. I mean, I'm sure you know as well as we all do that um, the stories of women are just not preserved in the same way that the stories of men are. Um, and so there just aren't as many resources for knowing. I mean, there are resources to know about Claire, but there's not as many resources to know about Claire as Francis and to know about the poor Claire's as about the, the orders of the Friars Minor. So, um, that said, I am by no means um, um, an expert in Francis or a medievalist. And so if there are any here who are, please do share your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say quickly that I think that um, it at least introduces a really interesting way of thinking about um, in Claire's own writings, she, she, the, the sort of the sanctity of, of the gaze in prayer um, is really important to her, uh, to gaze upon Christ. And, uh, and one can't ever demonstrate this, but, uh, but I do think that it, it's suggestive, Elizabeth, as you say, that, uh, that you know, what it, upon which Christ will they gaze in a quite literal sense, but, but that, same very, that very same cross. I think that's, 
just a suggestive uh, thought there. Uh, let's see, Kaylee Page, please. Hi, Dr. Carnes. Thanks Hi, so Kaylee. Much for that wonderful presentation. Um, you talked about how art and also some sorts of texts do this kind of ascetic imaging of Christ. Do you think there are ways that our like theology and our scholarship that we're working on um, in various modes can do that either formally or like even the content? Hmm. Have you ever read any theology that does that? I don't know. I just started thinking about it today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think that it's possible. Um, and I think it's more, um, I think that there's a lot of theologians who are interested in the way that language can be a site of divine encounter. Um, I think you have a lot of theologians who sort of secretly experiment with poetry. Prayer is very similar to poetry, so is liturgy. And, um, but I, I don't think that the forms of academic scholarship are conducive to that type of writing, the type of writing that's purposed towards encounter. Um, which is not to say that encounter can't happen, but it is to say um, it's sort of fighting against the kinds of norms because there's, there's in scholarship, right? To do scholarship is to be at a kind of remove from what it is you're discussing. Whereas the, 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 the beauty of art is that there's a, that remove is sort of taken away. And I mean, you can engage it like an art historian or you can engage it in a scholarly way, but the beholder sort of when you experience art as a site of, the, of divine encounter, it's like this experience of immediacy, um, which is very similar to the kind of immediacy of um, prayer when it's going well. Um, and of, you know, similar to what we see in like revelations and showings from mystical writings. Um, but it's just not the kind of engagement that scholarship is designed for. It's at this, it's, it's already at a remove. And so it's also encouraging the reader. I mean, what you learn to, the way you learn to read as a scholar is also to read at a kind of remove. So I think it's gonna be hard to find um, theology produced under current protocols of academic scholarship that encourages that kind of encounter. But prove me wrong. Thanks, that's helpful. Well, gosh, and I, I just want to I, I want to throw a little uh, plug in for your book, Natalie, um, because I think that uh, so so uh, Natalie's book um, uh, Motherhood I think is is an experimental form of scholarship in a certain way, uh, uh, you know, really sort of playing with form in in certain ways, and I think really does have a, an amazing beauty to it. So I'll just I'll plug that. Shamelessly for you there. Um. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the things that's interesting that I'm also exploring right now is that th this is happening in feminist theology a lot, where you have yeah. like uh, Tina Beatty and Susan Thistlethwaite are writing novels. Elizabeth Johnson wrote a dialogue. Janet Martin Soskis wrote a creative nonfiction. That I think feminist theology has always been sort of aware that theology is a symbolic and imaginative and aesthetic enterprise. And why is it now that in the last 10 years, we've had so many feminist theologians experimenting with these new forms of writing? And what, I don't know, I haven't really gotten to it yet of thinking like, are they after a kind of divine encounter, a re-education of the imagination and all of those things. But there is something interesting going on as feminist theology is coming to the kind of maybe the limits of what it can do in this particular genre and it's it's being pressured to new artistic forms. Yeah, a real sense of the constraints of the genre as it's been uh, currently practiced. I think that's really, mm -hmm. really great. Uh, Catherine Sepulveda. Hi, um, thank you so much for a really insightful and um, rewarding presentation. Um, I was wondering, speaking of your book, if you could perhaps connect a theme in your book with um, today's lecture, which was on pregnancy, desire, and lack. Um, 
you really beautifully touched on poverty uh, in iconography, specifically with respect to the San Damiano cross. But I was very interested, perhaps, in relating that to uh, the converse, which would be fullness, pregnancy, in, for instance, the Black Madonnas mm -hmm. in Montserrat, um, something which is not as old, but um, in Giotto, he has these beautiful images of St. Francis in um, the cathedral, but then he also does some very lovely um, filled fleshly Madonnas, and then in more contemporary images of Mary um, in various cultures, there is already within the, the form or the picture or the image, um, it's the, the lines, and I unfortunately can't show these right now, but the lines are very articulate, but then there is this um, almost gestalt image of a, uh, a fold out figure or form. Um, so I was wondering perhaps if you could comment on that um, as emblematic of poverty and your mm -hmm. book. Thank you. Um, yes, so th thank you, Catherine. That's a really, um, you threw out a lot of really big and complex themes there. So uh, I'm gonna start off talking about asceticism and poverty and excess, and remind me if I forget to talk about pregnancy. Um, but part of what I think is so um, interesting about Christian asceticism is the way it is not primarily oriented toward lack. Um, so this, I think, is an interesting difference from that the asceticism of mercy is not oriented towards lack. But, and this is very different than someone like, you know, Peter Singer, who says very similar things to a lot of um, moral theologians about owning property and the importance of need and things like that. But his orientation is toward a world in which we can eradicate poverty, is toward the eradication of poverty. That's the kind of vision. And so the kind of the elimination of lack is at the the core of it, which means that it's shaped by lack and need. Whereas the Christian um, orientation towards those in need is the, the wedding banquet at the Supper of the Lamb. So that whereas the danger in this singer vision is that you come to relate to those in need as problems to be solved in the language of Pope Francis or as, um, as um, sort of nagging reminders of your own failure to make need go away. Um, in, in the Christian tradition, and you see this a lot in Francis, you're invited to relate to um, all people, including those in need, as fellow supper guests at the wedding banquet of the Lamb. And so there's this orientation towards excess at the very heart of the asceticism of mercy. Um, and so that's that. So and you, and you see that that reshapes the whole Christian discourse around waste, or it should reshape the Christian discourse around waste, because the juxtaposition is right there in the Gospel of Matthew, right? Matthew 25, 31 through 46, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. You turn the corner into Matthew 26, and where are you? You're in Bethany, and you have um, um, Mary, who's, uh, is, it, is it, no, it's an unnamed woman in Bethany, who, in the Gospel of Matthew. It's Mary and Luke, I think. And she is, uh, breaks her expensive ointment um, in order to anoint Jesus. And the disciples say, why this waste, right? That they haven't understood what it means to live with those who are in need and the kind of vision that it's oriented towards. And the way that waste doesn't name particular objects. It doesn't name acts of adoration. Waste names the way we treat one another and creation as disposable. Um, and that's the, the reorientation. So anyway, so that to say, number one is that um, in the Christian tradition, poverty and asceticism are always oriented towards this kind of fullness that you point towards. Um, and that's present in this eschatological vision and is present in also what asceticism is with its, its renunciation of an immediate pleasure or good. And to the extent that that pleasure ceases to be a pleasure, asceticism is no longer asceticism. So the dynamic of asceticism requires the pleasure to remain pleasurable in some way. Um, and so it never becomes, is this right, never? Yeah, well, in many forms of asceticism, it doesn't become something bad that you're announcing. It's always good. And so the goodness and the pleasure and the fullness are important to asceticism being asceticism. Um, and then with pregnancy, oh goodness. I'm actually kind of curious to hear how, how you link this fullness of poverty to, to pregnancy and fullness and 
I feel like I could talk around it, but I feel like you have some intuition about it that I'd like to hear before I say anything. Um, I was actually thinking about it in terms of uh, distensio or literally in terms of corporeality, the stretching out of time or anticipatory longing. Um, how asceticism, for instance, something like Lent or Advent uh, uh, trains us, I guess, to inhabit this type of embodied um, longing for fullness. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it seems that the people who are most gifted or most full in the images are um, the ones who are uh, conversely the most poor, for instance, the Madonna and the child. Mm -hmm. um, what is interesting, especially in um, something that's really interested me since I went to Montserrat as a Black Madonna is the way the via negativa, uh, the apophatic encounter sort of plays out even in within the image itself. Um, there's something very uh, mysterious or significant about the fact that she is um, like Black, but also that it's very contentful and not contentless. And um, that perspectivalism is very interesting to me as I look at contemporary forms of iconography playing with um, uh, flesh and form um, in underrepresented cultures. So it was just something that was interesting to me that I've been tracking and I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. Um. Catherine, I hope that's great. That's great. And I hope you continue to think and write about it because that's definitely work that needs to be done. Thanks. And I think you're, you're pointing about Advent and Lent um, together with a pregnant body is super interesting because of course Advent is, you know, pregnant Mary, but um, it's also a time of fasting, like Lent is, oriented towards feasting, right? Another way that our asceticism is oriented towards excess in the Christian tradition. Um, and so in that way, an emptiness oriented towards fullness by the, by the desire. Um, but in that way, it's also an inverse image of pregnancy, which is a fullness that's hoping for a kind of emptiness as well. That's wonderful. Uh, we have time for just one last question. Uh, Kevin Clark, if you have your question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Carnes, for such an excellent presentation. And uh, I was so glad to hear your thoughts on, on the life of Francis. Um, I, uh, my 12-year-old uh, and I, uh, for her, her late nights, we, uh, this past summer, took to reading Bonaventure's Life of Francis out loud together, and it was a great experience. Um, and, and you were just speaking about recovery, and so, you know, I think that the figure of Francis is one in need of recovery, which is, is kind of surprising because he's so popular, but, you know, one of the things that arrests anyone who reads Bonaventure's Life uh, or Thomas's is um, what a work of art Francis's whole life was. You know, every chapter of Bonaventure um, really could be set to canvas or to wood. You can see how, you know, Renaissance art often put um, scenes from from Francis's life into panels, right? Um, and and so, but what's striking to me is is just how saccharine or even the kitsch uh, the popular art of Francis is. I, I hope I'm not you know, striking a nerve for anyone here, but um, you know, it's, it's almost as though these mass produced images that put, um, you know, can kind of put a false um, limit upon the collective memory of Francis, uh, which I think is a risk for any icon, but when, when you have a sort of accepted popular version of just this one frame, um, it can be a challenge. You know, I say this from, um, you know, the diocese, you know, his own archdiocese here, San Francisco. Um, and so um, I guess what I'm trying to tease out is, is whether a lack of iconographic variety is um, a, a, almost a kind of iconoclasm uh, for his life. Um, you know, whereas the art of uh, Fra Angelico or, or Lorenzetti really invites one you know, deeper into the mystery of Francis's life. So um, I guess, you know, on, on, more on the theme of recovery, how, how would you shatter the mold uh, so to speak, and kind of in, induce others into a greater wonder before uh, Francis, who you so well point out is um, in the church's memory as, as a uh, living icon. Thank you. I appreciate that question. Um, you know, the, the kind of iconoclasm that I favor is the iconoclasm in which we proliferate images in order to loosen the grip any particular image might have on our imaginations. 
So I have a more a softer spot in my heart for kitschy images than perhaps you do, um, because they're the way that many people um, connect to their piety and they connect to Francis. And so um, for many people, Fra Angelico doesn't speak to them today and the way that these sort of mass produced images are. So what do you do with that? I mean, my hope would be that, um, or it's not necessarily, I think that Fra Angelico doesn't speak to people as they just don't have access to Fra Angelico in the same way, maybe. Maybe it's some of both. But my hope would be instead a, um, a way that these, to me, the images become problematic to the extent that they do become, that they are seen as encompassing who Francis is and what his legacy is, right? To the extent that they become stopping points for our love of Francis, rather than invitations into a deeper life of Francis. And this comes back to like my conversation I had at the beginning with Michael, which is the way any image can become an idol. Any image can both give you what it images and prevent you from coming close to what it is that it's imaging, right? Any image, it, as something that mediates, it can mediate in the sense of blocking or mediate in the sense of giving. And I think there's the potential for kitschy images to mediate in the sense of giving. Um, and I think that potential is greater when instead of reacting to them with um, suspicion or hostility, we sort of try to take them up in love and um, show how they open up into a, a sort of wider legacy of who we can be for us. Thank you. Well, what a fantastic place to end. So I, uh, I you know, again, I, I wish we could uh, uh, have a credible round of applause for you, but thank you so much, Natalie, mm -hmm. for a very rich presentation. And, uh, and thank you as, uh, just let me echo uh, Elizabeth's comment. Let me thank you for your generosity in, in uh, conversation as well. I'm really grateful. Uh, friends, normally we would be uh, we would we would be able to raise a glass uh, to uh, to to Natalie and uh, to the work that's been done today. Um, so uh, I, I miss that honestly. I think we, everybody has earned their glass of wine or beer or whatever it is that they would partake of. I know we're all coming from different uh, times and time zones, but uh, I still welcome you. I invite you to go find a beverage of your own to uh, <laughs> to relax and enjoy. And, uh, and, and we'll be mindful of each other as we raise a glass tonight. Um, so thank you once again, Natalie. Tomorrow morning, we begin at 8.30, uh, bright and early, Eastern Daylight Time, and uh, welcome you all to join in there. Uh, please don't forget that at 10 o'clock on, uh, on Sunday, we will have a, a time for more rich uh, conversation in, in, a, in a less formal uh, forum. And uh, otherwise, Sleep well if it's time for you to sleep. And thank you all once again. Good night.